Welcome, everybody, to the Awaken Sober Podcast. It's a podcast about life and recovery through Christ. Through Jesus Christ. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we give a shout out Tactile Turn. Hey, hey. TactileTurn.com. Look them up. Some of the best writing utensils they have. Best man, and he's even a lifetime that thing on him, man. Not just them. No, they, everybody. Yeah, no, yeah, these better are just than the everybody. Best. And I love my use of tactile turn. I don't have mine with me because it's uh, sitting at home because I forgot it this morning. I, I suck. got a few more in the bag if you need them. No, nah, I got a couple at home. I'm good. I got a bronze, stainless steel, and the almighty <clears throat> Zerk. You got the uh, Zerk, yeah. We did get everybody a Zerk. Yes, we did. What about Country Grammar? No, Country Designs, yes. Country Designs. Country Designs on Facebook. I hope they, they know I know who they are. <laughs> she knows, baby. I just like to tease a little country grammar. They, her when she made our shirts, the shirts we wore last on last week's podcast came out, and that uh, like people seen that, and like she posted the shirts on her page, people started looking at um, awake and sober. Really, and that yeah. So we want to thank Country Design for making our shirts, putting our name out, and her people's as we put her um, her name out with us, our people. Yeah, and hopefully that, they decide to use it. Because I'll tell you what, she's got some clean shirts. Yeah. And, and they're, she's using the same thing that Tilva Holla uses. And if you've ever owned a Tilva Holla shirt, you know how comfortable they are. Yeah. And they, and yes, I wore mine yesterday at CR. Yeah, I It seen was that. nice. Yeah. Mine's upstairs. We're playing pickleball afterwards. So I usually throw on a shirt I'm going to get sweaty in after. And uh, so that way I don't have to change again. So we're missing a couple people this week. No Mikey, no Big Perm. No Mikey, no Big Perm. They're spending time with their wives. It's a good place for them to be. Hey, not bad. I mean, if mine wasn't sleeping, I'd probably be at home with her. No, I'd be at the podcast. She knows my boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> not only that, but then we have a special guest. So we don't want to miss this anyway, because we've been around Victoria for years. Yes. I can't say been around. She's been part of the family for... I've known her all six goodness. years of my recovery. Yeah, and I... I started, so I still started Celebrate Recovery back in 14. Um, so we've known each other since at least 2014. Yeah, at least yeah. 10 years. Wow. And you actually knew my husband, Kevin, back in addiction time. So Kevin yeah. saw Shane in addiction, and I got to see <laughs> Shane in recovery. <laughs> He's like, that's Shane? Are you yeah. sure? That's not definitely the Shane not the I knew. <laughs> definitely not the same Shane that Kevin knew. No. Or his cousin. <laughs> so, yeah, I know I know her husband's family pretty well. I mean, yeah. at least a couple of them. So I know Kevin and little Paul who worked for us for a long time. But Vicky, how are you? I'm doing great. My week was a little rocky. Uh, they had to up my Lexapro uh, a half half milligram because uh, I was starting to get really uh, depressed. I'm a lot like Christina where I get uh, insomnia and migraines and just complete darkness in yeah. in there and so uh talked with my psych of course and up my dosage it's only been a couple of days but it's been a good couple of days so i don't know how long it takes for that stuff to kick in but maybe it's all it, in my brain but i don't think it takes long it feels it feels pretty good my past couple of days have been good so but god's taught me a lot in in the depression of course so there's even that can be a blessing in disguise even though going through it is not a great time but <laughs> no it's, um, it's definitely not you know, fun but there are some good lessons that god learning can teach to us. praise in the waiting has been the biggest um lesson i guess i've learned in this past depression well i'm glad that you're here i'm yeah. glad that you're here today but i'm glad that you're here yeah right. me too. <laughs> <clears throat> both those d what's up my man how are you dude cr last night worship just rocked i didn't get wrecked like some we normally do on the on the worship days i got rocked like I don't, so if, uh brian and nadine there's you know a couple of good people that were waiting yeah. waiting they say give them a call let them know when they want to, we want them here and they're ready i know they'll, so, they'll come on the show anytime right i need to get them on here we'll get them on here but they were just like the energy that i was bringing to the stage and it was that worship music man uh brandon lake up there would count them yep. rocked it dude and that's that's my that's my song right there. Like on my way to work, on my way home from work, that and um, good day. Mm -hmm. Just two songs that have just been really doing something. And when we started off with that, and then in, into the next one, even the slow song, I've still felt the 
What was the, uh, why can't I think of the name of the second song? Oh, well, I don't know. Because, well, we went from Brandon Lake to the last song. <laughs> but, but he's on that one, too. What, what was, well, you opened up, we opened up the doors with, it might, might get, get loud. loud. Yeah. So that's the jump. That's the jump right there. But then we come up with count them. And then. Uh, I can't think of it, man. You keep talking. Does it just say Jesus? No. No. That's another one, though. Um, but keep going. I'm going. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I'm still I'm going from last go. night, man. I still got that energy. Got that razzle dazzle. I still. do, man. It's like, <laughs> razzle dazzle on a rattle. It's, it's got rattle. Yeah. That was the song, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Rattle. Them dry bones. The rattling dry of the dry bones. Bone. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. It made me cry. It was awesome, dude. So I don't know what God's doing with me, man, but I'm getting moved like that and got me on stage. Uh, another gentleman came up and was just like, dude, you, from where you started on that stage to where you're getting at now, it's just you're just showing, you know, you're you're growing up there. You're, you're getting that comfort and you're yeah. actually bringing it. And I'm just like, well, thanks, man. I appreciate that. Because, like, I even tell the people at work, I am not the kind of person that really wants to be on stage talking. And that and it's like, really? Because all you do in group is talk. Yeah. Well, that's what I do. But, you know, when I go to a meeting, I'm usually just quiet. I don't say much. Let's look at the podcast, even. Let's let's go back. Yeah. A few months ago, you didn't talk as much on the podcast either. But nowadays, we see you talking a lot more during even the podcast and then on stage. And so you're getting more comfortable just with the things that you do talk about. I'm getting more comfortable with letting the Holy Spirit take Mm -hmm. control of the situation. I think it's what's really going on. I think Derek really (laughs) likes having a microphone in front of him is the whole thing. (laughs) That's what it boils right. down to. He likes having a mic. There's nothing wrong with it. Not me, but Christ there. in me, the mic of glory. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, boy. Oh, here we go. Got it's going to get deep. See, no. no, I could tell you, when I was preparing for the worship, um, that third song, and I just had it. Let me look it up. Uh, nothing else. Mm-hmm. <coughs> There's a piece in there that says, I'm sorry for just going through the motions. And whenever I was trying to figure out and, and planning that night, that song, man, it wrecked me as I was yeah. just in the pre in the planning of and, and preparing it to, to be able to use it. I'm like, man, because I know I find myself doing that quite often or, or at least that during that time. And and I even talked about it on the testimony that I got to share churches. I was just going through the motions. I put on this mask. I put on this face to come here to to just be, and I was trying to fake it until I make it, but I, I wasn't doing a very good job at it. But, yeah, I mean, just going through the motion sucks. It yeah. sucks when you're in that season, but hopefully you're at least there going through the motions because then at least you're still alive. You're, you're still trying to be plugged in, but it's just not a good place to be. And so... It's not complete. No. You know, when you... Feel that spirit coming upon you and driving you and bringing you, bringing everything out of you. That's when you know you start that that completeness. You can start feeling God at work and stuff, and that's what it's gotten to be with me on stage. Is God put you know at work inside of me, without a doubt. Well, it's good to see you up there. That's why I keep scheduling you up there. Less of me, more of you, and it makes me happy. <laughs> That I'm telling you, y'all got me up there praying. Like, I get all my praying done in one day. I ain't got to worry about the rest of the week. <laughs> it's not a box, dude. It's a relationship. Come on. I'll play it. I'm just saying. It's funny because, like, I, I didn't tell him that he has to pray for any. It, it, the only thing up that is put on there as a prayer is after the third song. Mm. That's the only thing that's put up there as a prayer. The beginning isn't. Actually, I think in, in Planning Center it might say that, welcome in prayer. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times we don't during that that section of it, just because we I know that we're going to be doing it throughout. But he takes advantage of it if he wants to get up there and pray at the beginning. Pray if you I want love to pray. it. I love yeah. it. I think it's great. I'm praying. Right? That's what God tells me to do. <clears throat> what about you, man? How you doing? You know, been busy. Yeah. Uh, trying to uh, figure out this new gig and not not aggravate them to where I send too much business other places. I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> You know, I none of them watch them, the podcast, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, if they do, that's on them. Um, here's the thing: I send people where I think they're going to get the most benefit, right? 
Mm-hmm. Now, a couple of the people had just been personal referrals. And like, as soon as I talked to the family, they're like, we want to get this person out of state. Well, if you want to get them out of state, I know some great places. How much money do you have? You know, because it's going to take money to get them to some of the places. Um, but others, it's just like, it makes sense for you to go here. Or if it's mental health only, we don't really have mental health only in Missouri that that is good. And, and I know places out of state that are really good at mental health only. So, and then my referrals for around here are all Medicaid. <clears throat> We're private pay. We don't take Medicaid, right? And so it's like, Shane, what are you doing for your own company? Mm-hmm. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Not a whole lot. Just keep me on because it'll all be rolling in soon. Right. Because um, when the floodgates open, they just come. I mean, we put so many people in treatment over the last 10 years. It's sickening. And so we'll get them. But, yeah, I, but other than that, man, it's, look, I love Celebrate Recovery. Um, I think it's time to start thinking about growing it now that we've been doing the things that we've been doing. I think our leadership is truly ready for the next level. Mm-hmm. But I don't want to artificially grow it, and I, I don't know if that makes sense to a lot of people. Um, so I could, we could grow it, but it wouldn't be a sustainable growth um, it's just inviting people that I want to, I want people to come that one God wants there, um, that we could pour into, that, that we could grow and, and really just pour into and, and watch them grow and, and life change happen. I don't, I don't want to go steal people from other celebrate recoveries. If they want to come over and visit, great, come over and visit. But I want to see, I want to see the life change happen right there and that growth happen to where we could pour into them and do life with them. I want them to be sold out on the bridge and not just come and just to be. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the hearts at the bridge where we're at are second to none. I mean, a church that values people enough that they're going to put up a recovering addict that just went through some hell for the whole message time. They're not bringing them up for five minutes of a of a 35-minute message they're giving them the whole stage, the whole the whole time for service, and that that to me says a lot. That speaks a lot, because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. uh, I don't know many places that would do it. So mm-hmm. I love where we're at, and I and I think we're gonna grow it right. And I think by us taking our time, it's gonna grow healthy. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, yeah, we'll watch it. We'll see. Hey. But let's get into why we're here. Yeah, Miss Vicky Victoria. Woo-woo. Vicky Ray. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> And you know, and it's, what's funny is I call you Vicky every once in a while now, and I couldn't stand it for a long time. Yeah, that's true. And, and I would call you nothing but Victoria. And now I find myself every t- once in a while I turn around saying Vicky, and I'm like, what am I saying? Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> Victoria. Well, it's better than what you used to call me. You used to call me Elizabeth. Or my little brother. <laughs> your little brother. That's yeah. your little sister. Right, but she'd wear a hat. So I'm like, hey, yeah. how's my little brother? Always wearing a hat. Yeah, so. Um, She's still wearing a hat. Just not today. Just not today? Yeah, should have, man. Should have came on how you feel. Yeah, the one with the hook in it. <clears throat> that you always wear the little oh fishing gosh. hook. <laughs> I got that a long time ago when I was like 16 or 17. My dad took me fishing. And he said, whoever gets... I had been wanting one of those. All my friends had them. I grew up in the middle of nowhere, Virginia. All my friends had them. And I really wanted one. And my dad said, if you get a better, bigger bass than I do, I'll buy you one. And so... So you got a bigger bass. I got a bigger bass that day. So, <laughs> so it means a lot more to me than just an ornament on yeah. a hat. No, that's pretty cool. So tell us, where were you raised? Give us a little bit about you. Where were you born? Where were you raised? Uh, I was actually born in Virginia. Um, West Virginia? No, regular <clears throat> old Virginia. <clears throat> okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, back in 1985 was when I was born. Um, I actually, my parents couldn't have been probably more opposite. My dad was the church going, came from a Christian family. Well, Seventh-day Adventist family, um, kind of thing. And my mom did not, my mom came from drugs, alcohol. That's what she knew. That's what she lived. That was, that was her life. Um, so eventually my parents did divorce when I was five. Um, I was also molested by my uncle when I was five. Uh, so five was a very devastating 
year age for, for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had to, I feel like five years old was when I started growing up. Um, you know, that innocence got taken away and it was time to learn how to survive from that point on. Um, so 1990, you did not like. No. <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> Man. So any uh, brothers, sisters? I do. I have an older sister, younger sister, younger brother. So I'm the middle. I'm the middle, which probably explains Ooh. a lot of the yeah. sarcasm and the attention getting and, yeah, <laughs> the talking. <laughs> <laughs> That makes more sense, yeah. Well, what was, um, so you say your dad was a spiritual person. Was there a lot of that upbringing in your growing up? Um, unfortunately not, because they divorced when I was five. So dad moved out. Um, mom continued drinking and drugging and uh, started physically abusing us. Um, my older sister had moved out of the house for the abuse reasons. Um, so then, you know, it kind of got put on me to take the brunt of you know, shield my younger siblings from the blow. She was very, uh, broke my nose a couple times, would lock me in my room for days on end, uh, with a bucket to use the bathroom in. Um, she just was not a pleasant person when she was under the influence of everything. Um, when she was sober, she was great. She was, I'm very similar to my mother in looks and personality. We're, we're really similar, uh, when she was sober. Um, really funny, you know, love to sing constantly. Um, unfortunately though, you know, it just hasn't worked out for her and, you know, she grew up the same way. So, um, that helps with the forgiveness part of it is knowing that, you know, she, she, went through she it. did what she could with what she knew. Yeah. And I mean, we either go the same way or completely the opposite. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I mean, you could have two twins and one goes just like them and one, completely the opposite mm -hmm. yep i chose the mom path unfortunately i resisted but it happened i got the gene the gene <laughs> i got the addiction gene okay so tell us no i was just gonna ask her tell us a little bit more about what that family upbringing was like um when you took your first drink oh uh family life was pretty chaotic uh i actually um ended up getting raped when I was 13 by a high school boy. And when I told my mother about it, she told me, uh, that I deserved it. And we ended up getting into a physical altercation, um, where she broke my nose for probably a third, fourth time. I lost count, but, um, I ended up walking 10 miles in a snowstorm, uh, to my older sister's house and told her to call my dad and I'm going to go live with him. I, I had no idea what kind of person my dad was. My mom, did not keep us together um, growing up. So I had daddy issues, I guess, because I <laughs> didn't grow up with a dad. Um, but went to live with my dad when I was like 13. And he tried to raise me in a Christian atmosphere. And I was already, I was already on guard and broken and in survival mode so hard that. So you didn't really see much of dad until the age of 13. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a horrible way to grow up. So that's a long time to be in survival <clears throat> mode. Like, so now it's like, because I don't have to do that anymore. And I've been in recovery for almost nine years. It's just like, it, it's almost exhausting <laughs> to have to do that ever. Yeah. Because I, mean, I know what it's like to not have to do that anymore. <sighs> um, so I took my first drink when I was uh, in high school. Um, I was very adamant about getting really good grades because, you know, it was a small town in Virginia. Shout out to New Market Generals. Um, <laughs> See, that still sounds like West Virginia to me. It is Virginia, I'm telling you. Quick but it's right Virginia. there on the border, though. Like, she could have spit and hit West Virginia from where she was That standing. is true. It was 20 minutes your way. That's, yeah. You're not wrong on that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was close enough. Close. It was pretty close. Mountain folk, go that, you know. <laughs> but we always had good liquor, so... <laughs> I mean, there, there wasn't much to do. So I made sure I had good grades, partied on the weekend, still did all my sports and, you know, all the other stuff and got kicked out of private school eventually in Christian school because uh, I beat up a teacher's son. <laughs> and uh, 
Oh, why does that not surprise you? I know that, that really surprise? surprises that's, that's you. What was, that's what I was thinking. I am not surprised one bit. That's why we call her little brother. Yep. <laughs> If people only knew, I mean, you'll get a you'll get a taste of it as we go through this story. Right? Um, yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't mess with her. <laughs> no, I know better. I'm a lover. I'm not a fighter now. <laughs> no, she's got older brothers now to protect her. So yeah, I don't does. need to anymore. I don't have to fight for myself anymore. It's really nice. It's nice to come to that point in life where you know. It's nice when you don't have to fight for anything. Yeah. Like, God handles all my stuff. You guys can handle all the other stuff down here, <laughs> and I'm covered. I'm good. But when was that moment, though? So you started, you started drinking in high school. When was that moment that you crossed the line where drinking was, like, your main focus and anything else that you were doing? Uh, it wasn't until after high school. I graduated with honors um, and got out of high school and went to go into nursing school, but the drinking and... And partying and all the sex became more important than going to school. Um, so I ended up dropping out of college um, to continue doing that. I was. Well, I never knew she graduated with honors. I didn't either, and I've known her I for a long time. I thought she was a time. high school dropout. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> Let's just be honest, man. I did. I had no idea. Yeah, I mean, that... with the with the story I've heard before. Right. Yeah, I just assumed. Surprise. <clears throat> <laughs> Graduated with honors. The honor was kicking her out of the school. The, yeah. Right. She only plays dumb on TV. She's really intelligent. She stayed, really she stayed in the Holiday Inn Express yeah. last night. <laughs> I'm actually really smart. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, 19, I uh, had a job as a waitress at a Waffle House uh, for a very long time. Uh, it paid the bills. It paid my habit. Barely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember getting my electricity getting shut off when I was, like, 20 at my apartment, and so I ran an extension cord from my apartment to my neighbor's apartment, and I had Christmas lights, a microwave, and a coffee maker. And then I had a cooler for all my food stuff. And that's how I lived for at least a year because I couldn't afford electricity, but I could afford my alcohol and I could afford, you know, the Your drugs cigarettes. that I wanted to do, the cigarettes that I wanted to smoke, but I couldn't afford electricity. And I couldn't afford a car, so I had to walk. I mean, I lived in... Harrisonburg in Virginia at the time so it was a city as much of a city as it can be <laughs> don't laugh <laughs> but it was the big city it was right. the big city to us so they had buses and stuff <laughs> so I rode the bus more than you could say for this side of the water right I mean yeah we don't, we don't have even public. have a bus out here so no, we don't have public transportation here mm -mm. there's a reason about that though that's why you know we keep all the mountain folk on the other side of the river <laughs> That we do. <laughs> that we do. So were there any childhood dreams that you gave up on? I just wanted to get out, man. You just wanted to get out? I just wanted to get out. So I ended up um, right after high school was when I moved out of my dad's house, and I was determined I was going to leave. Um, I was going to leave Virginia. I was going to do travel, do something. Um, I did not want to be stuck. I, I, Even to this day, I hate being in one place. Um even the 10 hours that I'm at work in my cubicle, I can't seem to sit still. And I'm constantly getting up and saying hi to people or, you know, making you? an excuse to go to the bathroom or, you know, whatever. And um, so I was determined I was going to get out. Uh, I ended up, of course, where I'm at with not having any money, any mode of transportation, working at a Waffle House. That's not going to get me anywhere. I had nowhere. I was stuck until I found a guy. Of course. <laughs> of course. Mm. Because I learned how to get what I wanted and manipulate myself. Manipulate, manipulate them. others yeah. with myself to get what I needed. And so I found that in a guy. So and how so old were you around this time when you found a guy? I was 21. 21. When I found him. This is kind of blurry because I was a blackout drinker. So there's a, <laughs> there was a lot of things I don't remember. <laughs> well, that's a good thing, probably. But I'm going to do my best to get yeah. the timeline. <laughs> I just think of music. And then I then I can remember timelines a lot easier. This song came out of when this happened. And we could just look up the year. Oh, that's a good idea. I never thought to do that. That's how so, yeah, wow. I eventually yeah. Uh, did end up getting out. Um, you know, he was from Philadelphia, actually. So... We uh, saved up enough money after my dad said I, we couldn't move in to his house. Um, became homeless. He had a car, so we stayed in his car. Uh, saved up money and 
hunkered our asses to <laughs> Philadelphia. To good old Philly. Yeah. Best cheesesteaks ever, man. Oh, man. Straight and the Chinese the food on the corners. Whew. So good. <laughs> so the chop sueys around here were always the best. You yeah. just had to find one that said chop suey on it. Mm-hmm. All city bound. And they were they were the most fire always. Yeah. yeah. They were the late night ones on the way back from... Even over in Charlie Park, man, their chop suey place had some good food up yeah. in there. <laughs> but as I'm saying, anyone that just said chop suey on it, you were you were pretty much golden. Yeah. You know, uh that or Vin Ho. <laughs> they they were always after the East Boogie Nights. Yeah. So Boogie, Boogie Nights. <laughs> East Boogie. <laughs> yeah, we don't talk about East Boogie right anymore. <laughs> I feel like we're, we're like three states away from that. We're only just about an hour away. Wow. Right. That's a lifetime ago. Yeah. Wow. We had to do an episode just on East Boogie and what, you know, where we yeah. come from. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we do. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness, because it can't be glorified, but there were some good times. Oh, man. Like, you know, but let's not talk that. Let's talk Victoria. It's, the, it's Vicky's Aww. show. Yeah. It's all about That's her. Right. That's it. It's your show today. My show? It's your show. Oh, man. It's the Vicky Ray show today. Yep. That's why when the memory card goes out, we want to make sure it's free fresh because it's your show. <laughs> so, one of Derek's favorite questions. Go ahead and ask it. Wait, man, you don't know which one it was. Yes, I do. Root causes. Root causes. What brought it on? You shared some things with us, and I can see a lot, but what were some of the real root causes of what brought this addiction on? I grew up with it. I never felt like I was heard. I never felt seen. I never felt, you know, wanted. Uh, I had no self-esteem whatsoever. But if I drank, then I was myself. I was loud. I was boisterous. Everyone liked me. I was funny. You know, all of those things. So years later, when I get sober, I was terrified because I was like, who the hell am I going to be? without all the drugs and alcohol because that was my whole personality that was me and that's most people's fear too come mm-hmm. to find out i'm pretty awesome regardless yeah all so. right yeah. <laughs> i've only known the sober version and yet you know I, you didn't I, miss I, much i'm just the saying version you know was not very nice i'm cool with the one i know yeah, so <laughs> the other one is not very nice so give us some you're married now give us kind of like that story and then we'll move in after that to like the last year of your addiction okay so uh, um so from philly i uh got heavier into drinking um got introduced to a more powdery substance that i really enjoyed um and i was beating the crap out of my husband my boyfriend at the time um so things were not good at home i had some friends who were stationed in hawaii and so they said, hey, I know home life's not going really well. Do you want to come visit us for about a week? We'll pay for everything. Just come to Hawaii. Come see us. Um, and we'll pay for everything. I need some friends from Hawaii. I'm telling right. you. I was like, absolutely. Jumped on that plane as fast as I could. And um, and got there probably about two days later. Uh, the boyfriend calls me and says, hey, I got your best friend pregnant and you have chlamydia. So, wow, kind of. <laughs> That's you know, a nice phone call to get. Didn't have a boyfriend after that. Right. And so I was kind of stuck in Hawaii because I couldn't go back to. Well, now I have to find an OBGYN like right away, right? <laughs> and I'm in Hawaii. I have no idea where anything is or any anyone other than my two friends that I have. So I got to ask, did your best friend give him chlamydia mm-hmm. and knock her up? Mm-hmm. Okay, I, I I just didn't know if it was somebody else because I, I know if I'm listening to the podcast and you didn't answer that question, I'm going to be like, all right, who hooked him up with the chlamydia? <laughs> yeah, so the boyfriend got it from the best friend and boyfriend gave it to me. Yeah, and gave her the baby. Yeah, and he gave her the baby. <clears throat> wow. So I had no reason to go back to Philly. I, I was stuck. I was pretty much stranded in Hawaii. I had two people that I knew um, and... I didn't know what to do. I was pretty depressed for a couple days, of course. Um, 
and my friend was like, hey, you can find a guy anywhere here in Hawaii. There's tourists all over the place. There's military, blah, blah, blah. Let me just say I served my military on my back, and I did a fantastic job. So I support our troops. <laughs> um, I ended up wow. marrying one uh, Navy guy. Um, while you were there? While I was there. Um my friend that I was living with ended up having to kick me out um, because I was bringing in guys and drugs and drinking and stuff, and she didn't want that in her house. Um, I tried an AA meeting, and it was called Happy Hour, which is hilarious. But it's a heck of a name for an AA, <laughs> so for an AA meeting on the beach in front of a bar, like right across the street was a bar. <laughs> It's not prime location. Friends of Bill, come on over. Right. <laughs> not prime location. Um, but all I could see was just homeless people and, and people who lost families that I didn't have anyway. And, um, you know, all these DUIs, which I never could afford a car, really, so I never had a DUI because <laughs> I walked everywhere. Um, and the few times that I did drink and drive, I, by the grace of God, somehow miracle never got caught. So... So you're hanging out in Hawaii, homeless now again. Mm-hmm. Um, Which, if you're going to be homeless, I recommend Hawaii. <laughs> There's like you know public showers along the beaches, mm-hmm. and tourists are always pretty. Pretty friendly with money. Generous. Yeah, and when you're pretty, you can. You Shane, you do great here. Yeah. Yeah, you'd be a great homeless guy. In Hawaii. In Hawaii. I don't want to serve our military. <laughs> Not that I, have no, way. <laughs> I have no desire to do that. Love you, military people, but you know. Um, don't love you that much. Don't ask, don't tell, don't come <laughs> over here. Uh, so. You might have to cut that out. <laughs> no. Probably not. <laughs> that ain't going really, nowhere. I don't really cut out a lot of stuff anymore. No. I'll cut out silence, but that's about it. Everything else, just as long as there's not an F bomb or something dropped. That might be a mini clip. I am doing (laughs) amazing at that, by the way. No f bombs so far. Right, only a couple little small. Little things. Ass and the other one, so it it wasn't. I don't remember. Yeah, I just caught two of them. Yeah, there's only been two of them. No. So, um, how'd you meet your husband? Uh, We had a mutual friend um, that I had met through drinking, a mutual drinking buddy. Uh, So I went to his barracks room for a party and met. Kevin at a party and said, that is my meal ticket for today. And he was only supposed to be a very temporary thing, but he got very attached before I did because, again, survival mode. I don't trust anybody. I don't want anybody in my bubble. Um, You know, I just wanted, like, a dog in an apartment. That's all I was looking for. (laughs) I didn't want a picket fence. I didn't want to get married. I didn't want kids. I didn't want any of that stuff because my main love and my main focus was partying and drinking and and doing drugs and you know giving myself to everybody else you know i wasn't ready to settle down with myself let alone anybody else so how long was it be from the time you met kevin to the time that you married kevin three weeks three weeks Mm -hmm. he was my meal ticket yeah, so but so I much did. for not getting attached, huh? I did actually end up probably about a week before we got married, started getting really attached. Um, enough to where our first year of marriage, he was gone. He was deployed uh, in Iraq, and I was just wrecked. I I don't remember a lot of deployment. I remember a few calls here and there, but I was blacked out. I was coked out. I was not. Now, were you on base housing? I was. So I made sure our bills got paid, but I I got rid of everything else. Whatever bonuses came in, any of that stuff, I just threw it all away. I used it all on my addictions. So I, I can't even tell you at least 32000 in addiction. Just that? Just in that deployment time. Yeah. That's not including all the other years of, <laughs> right, <laughs> of yeah. doing mm-hmm. everything. Yeah, that was just that that That, that year particular deployment. time. I'd be a millionaire if I wasn't an addict. <laughs> yeah, that's what's sad. I, I think the majority of us could be. So let me ask you, what was the last year of your addiction like? Oh, man. I don't remember a whole lot of it, honestly. Um, at that point, I had been physically abusing my husband for about three years. Um, and 
again, blackout drinker. Uh, I was able to stop the hard drugs really easy because I still had my one and only true love, which was alcohol. Um, so I just drank every day. It, it was every day I would drink by myself. Um, it amazes me the insanity because as hot as it is outside, I would be outside at the pool right now getting obliterated and probably passing out on the side of a pool somewhere and mm. waking up God knows where because I decided to run off somewhere because I thought in my blank out strunk, you know, stupor that it would be a good idea <laughs> to go on an adventure because <laughs> I can't sit still. <laughs> so um, when I think back at the insanity of that, <laughs> it makes me very thankful to be sober <laughs> in, in air conditioning right now. <laughs> And here's what's crazy. I would get in trouble that she came over and talked to me like it was my fault when we worked together. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so no, I'm I'm the talker for <clears throat> me. I had to move offices because she wouldn't quit Multiple coming times. over. Yeah. Like three times. It was ridiculous. So that was the last year. Beating up your husband, blackout drinking. Yep. Cut myself. Like seriously cut myself to hurt myself. You know. For the first time, I had experimented with cutting when I was a teen, but I wasn't too into it. Like, it was more of a phase kind of thing. Like, it worked for a time, and then it didn't work, so I just stopped. Um, but, no, I literally, I broke a picture and took the glass frame out that had shattered and used the glass to cut myself. And just, like, in a ball, screaming, crying, saying, can you see me now? Can you hear me? Like, it was just like a flashback of everything that I wanted to say when I was a kid just came out in one moment. Mm -hmm. And Kevin was just, what can you do besides just watch the person you love just die on the inside? I mainly feel for him. Like, of course, I remember, and I remember that feeling, and I don't like that feeling, of course, but to have empathy for my husband and to be sober enough to have that empathy for my husband is such a gift, and it's such a reminder to not continue to do the things that put me in that situation ever again. How's sobriety been for you now? Are you not going to oh, ask all... her what was that moment of clarity? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I just I think she kind of just said now. it, man. <laughs> she just kind of woke up was like, dude. <laughs> so the next day after that fiasco, uh, you know, Kevin had sat me down and was telling me, you know, this is what you've been doing me for, to me for years. He was terrified of me, and I never knew the extent of the abuse until he sat me down that day and told me. So that was my turning point of okay, I'm going to try this for real. Uh, obviously the first time didn't work out for me, but I'm, I'm going to try for real. Um, so I made it about nine months sober, nine months sober. I thought, okay, I have tools under my belt. Now I'm in CR. I accepted Jesus, um, in 2015, got baptized. Everything is, you know, I have Jesus now. Everything's supposed to be fixed. Um, that was not the case. <laughs> life still happens and I was not prepared for that life that happens because I didn't have the experience to back up the tools at all I didn't even give it a chance to have that experience so I stopped going to meetings I stopped having a sponsor um I was lying to everybody and not telling anybody that I was drinking but still going to CR and still going to meetings um and then luckily one of the tools that I had that I've always had is journaling and I read a journal entry that I had done, uh, when I was drinking back when I'm sober the next day. And I was just like, Oh my gosh. Like that was, that was my wake up call of, I really, I really need to give this a true shot because worst case scenario, there's always drinking and drugs later. Like if this doesn't work out, I'll just go back. <laughs> You know, but that just hasn't been the case for me because I've taken this seriously. Like this is for me, this is life or death because I remember the death. I remember the hell of what I've been through, whether it be through childhood or what I put myself through as an adult. I remember that hell and I'm not, 
I don't want to go back. Spirituality right there, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, uh, Jeremy. That's his thing. Spirituality. Uh, religion is for those that go to church on Sunday not wanting to go to hell. Mm-hmm. Spirituality is for those who've been to hell and ain't trying to go back. That's right. <laughs> so, That's right. Yeah, we, Jesus came and picked us up out of hell. Yeah, he did. We ain't got no business going back. Nope. <laughs> yeah, I remember that conversation. I remember, I remember it well. When you decided, all right, I'm going to get honest. Mm -hmm. And the question was to you, do you remember what the question was? No. (laughs) Did you learn? Did you learn something or did you not learn something? I remember you calling it a learning experience, but I was so ashamed at that point. Like, I just wanted it to be over. Yeah, but I was afraid that if you were too shameful, that you wouldn't stick around. So I needed you to see that you learned what you needed to learn, and now it's time to move forward. Mm -hmm. That's what I was worried about. Well, so far it has been a learning experience. I definitely have learned my lesson. (laughs) But that's the thing. I mean, we could have a relapse and learn nothing from it and then have 10 more afterwards. Or we could have a relapse and truly learn something and, and grow from it and never go back. And that's what you've done. Well, and the thing of it is, I know I have another drinking day in me. I don't know if I have another recovery in me. Probably not. I don't think I can do this again. Because, like, if I lose, especially at nine years right now, in my own head, if I lose this, I'm not coming back. Because that was too much for nothing. So. No, I got one. I get to go. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) But, hey, she's keeping it 100, though. That's what what it's about, though. Yeah, I mean. Let's do it, you know. Look, I, I got a, beep, a bleep button. It yeah. works well. Beep. Don't you have one on that pad? Uh, probably somewhere. Let's try it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's not it. <laughs> That's the one you there need. You we, we give her the applause there for uh, <laughs> dropping it, you know. Let's just do we it now. We give her two, two applauses for dropping an F-bomb. <laughs> That's all right, though. It's all right. We'll, we'll do that. We'll just put the applause over instead of the bleep because I'll pull it down. I it's like the easy. applause. Give us a little bit about early sobriety. What about sponsorship, steps, um, sponsees, carrying people, the message? Professionals, people that you've worked with in your program to get you where you're at today. Um, my first sponsor was not great. She was a very religious, uh, and I emphasize religious, not spiritual on that one. Um, I had to go to her church. I had to go to her Bible studies. Um, and, you know, freshly sober, I I will do whatever you tell me to do. Of course I will. Even though at that time I was actually Wiccan. I was pagan. Um, I hadn't accepted Jesus until 15. This was 14 when I'm brand new and sober. Sober. White knuckling it, I should say. Um, and... So I ended up, we had to part ways. It did not end well. She called me a few choice words, and I told her good Christian women shouldn't talk like that, and she called me another word that I can't repeat. And <laughs> oh, you so, it. <laughs> I'm just glad you're not. <laughs> and so that relationship didn't end, you know, didn't end well. Um, so I didn't have a sponsor after that, and that's when I relapsed, and then my sponsor after my relapse, uh, Kim was an angel. Like I needed her as my sponsor. I wish I would have had her from the get go. The way she taught me to do the steps, um, and how it was just, she was very trying to find the word. No big word. No, (laughs) I want to say intrusive, but it wasn't intrusive. It was just very, like, particular in the way she did things. And it got it got a lot of things out, a lot of my childhood trauma that I got to come out. And um, she was just very good about getting things out of me. I don't know how she knew me as well as she did because I still wasn't as honest with her as I could have been at the time. Um, but she was amazing. There was one day I was white knuckling really bad and really wanted to drink and she stopped everything she was doing and picked me up and said we're going to a ball game and brought me to a ball game just because forget forget coffee we're going to a ball game we're going to a ball game because that's that's gonna eat up hours (laughs) right right? i love it not i mean 
we had, of course, we ended up having two drunk guys in front of us, you know, asking if we were sisters and the whole pickup lines and all that was going on. And I'm like, I find it ironic. You brought me to a ball game to stop me from drinking. And all I can watch is two guys getting drunk. She's like, yeah, but watch how they're acting. Yeah. Like, that could be you. That was what I did a lot when I first got sober is watch the drunk people around me. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that used to be me. And then you just didn't want to be that butthead, that that clown. Mm -hmm. Mm. So what were some of those challenges early in sobriety? Um, Well, I know a lot of people have, a lot of my sponsees have said, you know, it's been hard to get rid of friends that are still active in addiction and and all that stuff. Um, I was fortunate, I guess... (laughs) I guess fortunate enough that uh, my friends were literally just drinking buddies and they just kind of disappeared on their own. Um, The hardest part has been being accountable to another person. Um, Having to tell another person that I don't really know, uh, i.e. my sponsor, my whole life story and expect this person to help me through life when I don't trust, I don't trust anybody. Right. Like, even, you know, after my relapse, I still had struggles with trusting people and opening up. And so Kim had a really hard time, I'm sure. Prying uh, all that out. Prying everything out of me. Uh, Because I I did not call her every day like I should have. And, you know, I didn't meet her at meetings like I should have. I came up with excuses. Um, But she kept me on as a sponsee for so long. I don't. Like, I don't know how she did it. I don't know if I would have fired me or not, but. Well, I'm, she's I'm seen something in you. I'm not good at being held accountable to other people. I don't like being on the phone. Like, you can text me all day. I don't care. We can go meet for coffee. I love meeting people, but I hate being on the phone, man. Hate it. Me too. So my sponsor now will meet with me as opposed to being on the phone because I just, I'm going to fail you every <clears> time. <laughs> just the way it is but you find something that works yeah I mean that's the whole thing is just finding something that works for you and that you want what they have and you find something that works mm-hmm. I mean not not every sponsor is for every person well and I had to get a temporary too like hey could you sponsor me for 30 days until I can you know find somebody more permanent or whatever however long and you come up with that agreement so um you know, you can even find a temporary sponsor. There's literally no excuse for not having a sponsor. There really isn't. Because Agreed. you can have a temporary sponsor. You can have somebody at least hold you accountable to say, hey, I need you to call me every night at 6 o'clock or whatever. Yeah. Like, if you want to get sober, if you want to put as much work into getting sober as you did to get messed up, then it's going to work. But if you don't, then you're going to fall on your face and you're going to end up back at ground zero. And then the question is, do you really want to be sober? Right. Like, we is know it for, worth it? Yeah. Because at the beginning, we know the desire to stay sober is not greater than the desire to quit drink, uh, than the desire to drink. Mm-hmm. It, it's hard. That, that shift takes a little while. It does. Mm-hmm. It does. And it, I don't think it was until like my third year of sobriety when it, it did that shift where it was like, okay, my life is actually better sober than it ever will be drinking and a lot of that has to do with my continued relationship with christ right because i can't there is no way on this green earth that i can stay sober on my own free will right that's just not in the cards so without jesus christ and without that relationship i have i got nothing well, I, can, took, I can agree with that. I said I took my next question about a higher power <laughs> <laughs> relationship. All right, there we go. I Ladies talk to and gentlemen. all day, every day, like I'm a crazy person. Yeah, I can't believe that it took you three years for that shift. I, it did. I mean, I knew for me it was a year. Because mm-hmm. at that year mark, I said, well, if, if this, this, and this don't happen, then I'm just going back to drinking because I had more when I was drinking than when I had when I was sober. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of us go through those kind of things. So three years, man, it's a long time. I was waiting for the other shoe to drop, man. I, I was waiting for the catch. There had to have been a catch. Oh. Like, in my life, it, like, from that time in my life, there nothing goes right. Like, nothing works out for me. 
Right. It never has. So why would it start now? So I was waiting for the other shoe to drop for three years. And I'm like, this is freaking exhausting. I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, I have to do step three. I have to give it to God and literally give this to God and do a whole step three on it. And so I did a whole step three on it and it was third year. It was, you know, God, God took it. It worked out. What was that like though? That's because you shared with us already that you were waking mm -hmm. when you first came into recovery. Mm -hmm. So that moment that, uh, what we, we talked about it last or last, yeah, last week, that spiritual um, awakening. When was that? When did that hit? Um, probably four five weeks in the CR um, it was during worship service music's always been a constant in my life and listening to a worship service um, at CR I don't know I got goosebumps I was crying I felt remorseful like it was all the things that I'd never felt before and I was ready to let it go um, and I'd never felt that before ever um, and there was no amount of, you know, protection spells or sage that you can blow to get rid of yourself. Um, the only one that can help you get rid of yourself is Jesus. Because you have to get rid of yourself to be more of him. And so I, I accepted that. I, you know, the feeling that I had gotten from that and the sense of security that I had never felt before, I was, I was ready to let go. Mm -hmm. So I asked you what was the biggest challenge. What's been your biggest blessing, your biggest gift recovery has given you? Oh, my gosh, to be a sober mom. That's easy. That was the that's... quickest anybody's ever answered. <laughs> that, that's I love easy. It. Oh, that's so easy. Because I grew up with such a crappy mom, right? I was, I had all these fears when I was preggers that uh, I was going to turn out just like my mom. But I forget that I'm the sober version of her. Hmm. And I get to be that sober version to my daughter. And so that is the greatest gift of recovery for me, is that she never, never, never has to see me in that dark moment, ever. And she Damn, never has to it. go through the things that I had to go through for my mom. Mm. So that's the biggest. That's the biggest. All right, man. So we all going to get wrecked here? <laughs> I'm, I'm wrecked, dude, because... This daughter she speaks of is my goddaughter, and I'm very in love with this little girl. Uh, this little girl. She wasn't supposed to be here. <laughs> no, and she's really means something to me. I spent some time with her yesterday. I love that little girl, man. When I see her, that smile on her face, the, the joy that it comes off that little girl's face when she sees me, it's beyond. And I'm very thankful to God that you are that sober mother to raise that little girl. Cause, mm -hmm. I mean, I, that little girl, I ain't going nowhere that little girl's life. I'm going to be there always. Well, she's nothing but happy. You can't help but love her. It's she's true. nothing but joy out of that. Uh, I'll disagree with that. I've seen her run around and cry. <laughs> I've, I've heard it at okay, church now. as long now. as she gets her way, she's nothing oh, but there, joy. There we go. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Man, the greatest answer we could have ever heard on this show and, yeah, and she actually wasn't it. supposed to be here. I uh, and I had cervical cancer, um, oh. probably about four years into my sobriety, and um, they told me I wasn't supposed to have kids, and you know, took out some of the goods. And years later, back in 2020, here she comes. You know, she wasn't even supposed to be here. So <clears throat> I'm really excited to see what God has planned for that little one. And I just hope that I, you know, I pray every day that I can be a good steward to her to cradle that. Yeah, and you know God has plans because otherwise you wouldn't have got pregnant. Nope. Yeah. Man, I love that. I, I don't even know where to go from here. <laughs> that, I mean, I mean that, that's the mic drop. That's the, Right? That was the answer of all answers right there. And <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's, there's nothing that we need to even continue other than know that God has done amazing work in her life. Yes. Gave her the biggest gift you could ever give. And, and she's doing a get great job. Thank you. So far. That... Who, Freya? No, Freya's and Mommy? Right, yeah. Freya, got, yeah, Freya got me, I'll tell you that, man. But yeah. 
Freya's doing a great job at raising Godfather and Victoria. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. She's strained as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if she hasn't yet, she's doing, putting in a lot of work, <laughs> but she's doing it. What else you got then? I really, man, you know, Victoria, I, I appreciate you coming on the podcast with us. Uh, Anytime. You've, you've been, you've been a part of my recovery. You've been a part of my wife's recovery. And that, uh, like I said, you asked me to be godfather to your daughter. And, you know, that's something I, that's a title I take very seriously. You do a good job. Thank you. And uh, this, I don't think this, we would ever, this podcast would ever have been complete, not just this episode, but the podcast itself without an episode with you. And I thank you for being here. Aw, thank very you. Very much. Thank you. Any last closing remarks that you want the listeners to know? Anything that you left out that you just, they need to hear? I don't know. For me, all it took was a mustard seed. A mustard seed to say, okay, God, I'm going to give you this. Just this. And just baby steps the whole way. Uh, you don't have to have it figured out right now. Um, you literally just take it one step at a time. And that's why they're in the order that they're in. If you miss a step, you go back. It's not a big deal. <laughs> There's no race. You're doing this for the rest of your life. You literally do not have to hurry this up. Um, and step four isn't as scary as everyone says it is. You're literally just writing it down on a piece of paper. And that is it. The scary part doesn't happen until step nine. So don't freak <laughs> out. I agree. I love the four step. Yes. D, in closing, you got anything? Hey, uh... No, man, I'm, I'm, I'm shut, dude. I, I don't I mean, either. I mean, it's... It, Victoria? That answer wrecked me. Yeah. Because... It was perfect. You know. It was perfect. It uh, was. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of my life for as long as you have. Um, and I know we've been in and out, but never quit loving you. Oh, regardless. No. Oh, no. Um, and having you here is phenomenal. Thank you for the answer that that Breakfast. we all needed to hear. Yeah. <laughs> God's greatest gift, the gift of life. Mm -hmm. He gave you a gift of new life and he gave you a gift of life. Mm -hmm. And he's entrusted you with both. And you have done amazing with both those gifts. Even when I didn't believe in him, he was there. Uh, it, like that snowstorm, those were his footprints. Those weren't mine. Provenient grace. Yeah. Yes. The grace you had before you knew God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's definitely had my back more times than I can count. Even mm. when I didn't reckless love, that's that's my wreck. That's my wreck. <laughs> well, I'll make sure we play it. Thank you. There you yeah, go. anytime, anytime. Yeah. As Thanks. long as somebody else can get wrecked besides yeah. just me, <laughs> right? Well, then, how about this from everybody here at the Wake and Sober Podcast? Oh yeah, you might as well go ahead. We got to bring up our sponsor, Tactile Turn, TactileTurn dot com. Some of the best writing utensils. They even got knives. They got flashlights. And they're coming out with binders, right? They're going to come out with notebooks soon, yeah. So, tactileturn.com and Country Design, Facebook. Tell them that uh, Awake and Sober sent you. With Country that, Grammar. <laughs> hey, from everybody here at the Awake and Sober podcast, we love you guys. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you soon. Yep. Peace. Bye.